All right, so as we get into chapter three, the molecules of life, we're looking at taking what we learned about basic chemistry, which was learning what the elements are, learning the rules of bonding, and we're going to turn that into um, something that makes sense to you in a way that is not just rote memorization. It should make sense. The rules of chemistry should help you figure out why things are the way they are. As always, your chapter starts out with a, um, a sort of a relevant case. In this case, we're looking at um, some aspects of nutrition. These are, how many of you guys pay attention to your nutritional needs? Like even a little bit. You read labels or you try to eat right? How many of you take supplements? Yeah, what kind of supplements are you taking? Amino acids? Do you take vitamins and minerals? How many of you take vitamins and or minerals? Just raise your hand, be brave. I do, I take calcium supplements, duh. I should take vitamin D, but I don't. My doc told me to, so I should, but I keep forgetting to take it. How many of you take amino acids, like a powder, protein? And what's the point of that? Jonathan, what's the point of that? Muscle, and, and how does taking a protein supplement build muscles in a way that eating a nice juicy steak does not? It's what? It's absorbed more quickly. Um, I'm not sure I buy that. I'm willing to look at the evidence on it, but I know how the human digestive tract works. So yeah, I suppose it could be absorbed more quickly. Um, does absorbing it more quickly mean it gets into your muscles more? That's the idea, right? I always thought the idea of a protein supplement was to avoid the fat. Is that, have you heard that before? So if I eat a nice juicy steak, my husband's a great cook. I never cook. He cooks dinner every night. So when he cooks steak, it's like, it's something I look forward to. I do. And what makes steak moist? What keeps it from being just a dry charcoal briquette? It's the fat and some of the water, but mostly the fat. So do we worry about fat? How many of you worry about fat in your diet? Guys, I'm just guessing you don't. Am I right? You don't worry about fat in your diet, do you? Some of you guys do. So I do. I've seen evidence that correlates fat consumption with an increased risk of certain kinds of cancers. You all probably start worrying about that more when you're a little older. But have you heard that trans fats are bad for you? Have you heard that? Yeah? So when you go to the store and you buy something that is a product designed to give you fat, which is like butter or margarine or shortening or something like that, what you'll find on the label now is that it says zero trans fat per serving. <coughs> I always wonder about the per serving thing. Either it has it or it doesn't. What difference does it make? Well, that has to do with federal guidelines. It has a smidge of trans fat. Just, just it, it, it rounds off to zero if you just eat a tablespoon of it. So, um, so I want you to read this <clears throat> article, and we'll talk about it next class time. Because next class time is when we're going to talk about fats. We'll talk a little bit about trans versus cis today, but we're not going to talk about trans fats particularly. We're going to start with just the basic idea of the organic molecule, the organic molecule. And for those that are looking at our screen on the south, if you'll just turn to one of the other screens, you can see the PowerPoint is there. And of course, this is posted already in Canvas for you. <clears throat> so we're gonna look at carbon, and we're gonna look in, at carbon particularly in terms of um, organic compound. So I'm going to put on the screen that, you, that is just on this one side of the room. Here is a carbon backbone. How many carbons are in this backbone? Does everybody see six of them? Do you agree that while it looks like it's sort of a straight molecule that the bond zigzag? So when we draw that, and you're going to be drawing some, when we draw that we tend to draw you know, our little black carbon atoms. I don't know why black or gray is just traditional for carbon. It's just one of those things. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and they bond like this. Now, how many bonds does each carbon need to make? 
This is something we did last week. How many bonds does each carbon atom have to make? If you don't remember, look it up, but the answer is four. Okay, so each one of these carbons needs to have four lines emanating from it, although it can have double bonds. We're not going to do that right now. One, two, three, four. Okay, so as I have it on this other screen with the model, is that a complete compound or is it a complete molecule? Is it complete? No, because none of those carbons have enough bonds. Okay, so when we look at organic chemistry, we're looking at carbon as our backbone. We know it needs to have four covalent bonds. We also know that some of those bonds can be polar and some can be nonpolar. And we know something else very interesting. In the actual, or, uh, the actual uh, molecule, and in, I say real life even though it's not alive, take a look up on here on my screen. One thing this can do is it can flip around. So that's my same six carbons and now they formed the ring, okay? So I can have a straight chain form or I can have a ring form and the same molecule, the exact same molecule can flip between these different forms depending on how much kinetic energy it has. So I've got rings, I've got chains, I have them flip-flopping back and forth between them. Um, you do need to know what the term organic actually means. Organic means containing carbon and hydrogen. This is not the same way we use organic when we're shopping for organic food. What does it mean to be organic in the grocery store? What does it mean? No pesticides. Um, very often it means no genetically modified organisms or workers. that. It also means it's possible. Okay, so we have two different meanings for the word organic depending on context. In the context of chemistry, organic means it's made mostly of carbon and hydrogen. So looking at my molecule up on the screen, I can put some hydrogens on here, and I'm going to put quite a few. Because what we're going to find is that if we're going to make just the basic organic molecule, that almost all of the bonds of that carbon are going to be bonds with hydrogen. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Well, that one doesn't want to stick. Okay, so I took a plain carbon backbone and I turned it into an organic compound. How did I do that? I just stuck some hydrogens on it. I'm not done yet because I'm going to turn this into a carbohydrate in just a minute. But does everybody agree that what I started with was just a carbon backbone and what I have now is organic? What made it organic? I stuck the hydrogens onto the carbons. That's what made it organic. Do we have questions at this point? Okay, so when you're looking at an organic molecule, and this is true of proteins and nucleic, all of the organic molecules, that the structure determines its function. That is, the arrangement of the carbons and hydrogens and the other things, which could be oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus, that that structure determines its function. That knowing what chemicals are combined to make an organic molecule allows us to classify it <coughs> into a protein or a carbohydrate or a lipid, and that's going to determine what its role in life is. So we've got these different ways of talking about these organic molecules. We have the structural formula. We have carbon ring structures. We have ball and stick models, and we have space filling models. What kind of model do you think this is? Looking at the list of choices. 
Would everybody agree that's a ball and stick model? And that's generally what I try to draw when I'm drawing them for you, ball and stick. But if I were going to write this as just a structural formula, for example, the structural formula of a simple sugar might be C6 H12 O6. That's not the, that's the molecular formula. Okay, so if I wanted to draw the structural formula of this, I could do it with ball and stick, or I could do it with space filling, which is harder to draw, uh, but I can, I can write it out. Now, as science majors, there are a few we expect you to be able to recognize, and you're going to have a list of those. Which ball and stick models do you need to be able to recognize? And um, one of the first things to recognize them is to know what will be found in each kind. Are you with me on that? Okay, so the other thing is that they can take different forms, and so while you see this nice ball and stick, well, this is actually a structural model. It's not even ball and stick. It's just got the, the symbols for the elements. That's glucose. That's kind of shoehorned in there. That's really hard to see. Would everybody agree that's hard to see? So you have to follow all the little lines. So we're going to redraw glucose here. And glucose is one that I'm going to give you credit for being able to draw. There are, I think, three of them I'm going to ask you to be able to draw. Glucose is going to be one of them. And you'll thank me when you take organic chemistry. <clears throat> um, but part of what we're learning is just different ways that we draw things. So when we look back at our first picture, that's pretty complicated when you look at glucose here, but if you just look at, let me try to highlight this, where the carbons attach to other carbons. Can you see carbon here, 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 here? How many carbons is that? Oh, that's not one. Hang on. That's an oxygen right there. How many carbons do you see? One, two, three, four, five. This is actually a carbon right here. There's our sixth carbon. Okay, but we do also see within our structure here that there's an oxygen in this thing we call the rings. Everybody see the ring? So when we draw it in a simplified format, it's just a lot easier to recognize. Okay, so do you remember over here with my model, I said I could turn this into a ring? So we're going to do that with carbon. Actually, I've ordered some molecular models. I, I'm hoping they'll be in on um, Thursday so that we'll get to play with them. But in the meantime, we'll just have to suffer with watching along. Okay, so different ways of representing them. There's glucose in basically the same model that I've been using. Remember that black is carbon, red is oxygen, and white is hydrogen. And there's a space filling model that shows how it would exist if you could demonstrate it in real life. Okay, um, I want to skip to something real quick. We'll come back to those because those are kind of scary. Um, nope, I don't see it. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce a term that um, is somewhere in this PowerPoint, and I just can't find it right now. And that term is isomer. And here are two word roots that you're going to see again. Iso means equal or same. And mer means unit or body. So we're going to see two isomers. I'm going to draw them for you as well as I can, and then I'll demonstrate them on the um, on the molecular model. So I can have two things with the same molecular formula, C6H12O6, and I can build it in two different ways. Just like you can use the same Legos to make two different things, 
you can use the same atoms to build two different molecules. So um, in one, I'm going to build something that's going to look a lot like glucose. I'm just not going to fill it all in. So how many carbons do I need? Six of them, right? In one case, I can put a double bonded oxygen on the end, and in a different isomer of the same um, same number of carbons, I can put a double bond oxygen on a different carbon. So that's two isomers of the same thing. Okay? So you need to know what isomer means. If I say that C6H1206 is the formula of glucose, and then I tell you, well, it's also the formula of fructose, how can that be? How can they both have the same molecular formula? <coughs> the answer is they're isomers. Do they act the same in the body? Do glucose and fructose act the same everywhere in the body? Absolutely not. So we use fructose as a sweetener, right? You've heard of high fructose corn syrup. Fructose is fruit sugar. <clears throat> fructose on your tongue tends to taste sweeter than glucose. So if you were trying to get the same sweetness without using as much sugar, which one would you use? If you use fructose, you get sweetness without having to use as much. Okay? So they act differently. When they get to your digestive tract, they're absorbed differently. When they get to your liver, they're metabolized differently. They're two different molecules that happen to have the same structural formula. So what's the word we use for that? Isomers. Okay, so now you know what an isomer is. I want to back up a little bit and talk about something that's not in the book, just to give you a better sense, maybe, of where all these things came from. And as I do this, we're going to get into the carbohydrate group. So when uh, life began, Early life had to have energy, it had to have chemicals, and it had to have some kind of compartmentalization, some cell-sized compartments to be able to accumulate things in. But when um, photosynthesis began, the idea behind photosynthesis is really ingenious because we're going to take two different molecules and combine them. Can you all identify these molecules? You know what the color coding is, right? So what's this thing? That's carbon dioxide. And what about these guys? What are they? Those are water molecules. These are both very stable. Carbon dioxide sits in our atmosphere. It doesn't blow up. It doesn't, it's not very energetic. It doesn't combine with other things. It just kind of sits there. So I would say that these are both very stable molecules. What I want to be able to do is combine them into an organic. So let's stop and think, is carbon dioxide organic by our definition? Why not? It doesn't have any hydrogens attached to those carbons. Where are my hydrogens in this view? Where do you see the hydrogens? They're all attached to the water. Does water like to give up hydrogens? It's pretty stable the way it is. So if I wanted to combine these, I would have to crack at least one of these double bonds, I would have to crack a hydrogen loose from a water, which is not that difficult, but it needs to have something to react with. And in living systems, we actually use enzymes to do that. We'll talk about enzymes probably next week. Um, but, but you need to have some appreciation of just the chemistry behind this. It's not that simple. So I'm going to take my carbon dioxide, and with the help of enzymes today, I'm going to crack one of those double bonds, just one of them. And then I'm going to crack a hydrogen loose on a water molecule. Okay? Are you with me so far? All right, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take what was a double bond and I'm going to stick an oxygen on that. And then I'm going to take my other hydrogen. Now, I want you to look at what I did. I started with one carbon dioxide and one water. Do I have the same number of molecules that I started with? or the same number of atoms that I started with. Is everything the same? No leftover parts? It's always good when you're like fixing something, a motor or whatever, you don't want any parts left over. So what do you see that we have? All right, this one's tricky. Did I make 
an organic compound. Look again. We made this last week. <clears throat> this is carbonic acid. Okay? So, actually, I messed up. So, what I wanted to do was something like this. Okay? And in order to do that, it takes a couple of waters. So, let me see how I'm going to do this. OOH. Let me grab another stick. This is not cheating to grab another stick. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Oh, it's still messed up. Now, is this organic? I'm going to break these. Is this organic? Yes. yes. Why? Not because it has four hydrogens. Because there's a hydrogen attached directly to the carbon. Okay? Does everybody understand the difference? Questions about that? All right. So what I have to do when I'm making carbohydrates, I have to crack carbon dioxide and I have to crack water. I literally have to break the bonds. And in the process, I'm going to stick a water molecule onto a carbon. And when I make glucose, what was the formula of glucose? C6 H12O6. So since I have six carbons, and I have six oxygens. Does it make sense that each carbon is going to get an oxygen? And I always worry that I'm not going to have enough parts when I do this. So in order to, in, when we do this in modern biology, that is in organisms that are alive today, we're not starting straight with the carbon dioxide and straight with the water. We're starting with some things that we already had. And we're actually going to do that. Synthetic biology, um, I think it's in test three. So there's a glucose molecule in the ball and stick model. Every carbon has four bonds. Every carbon is attached to an oxygen. Some of the hydrogens are attached to the oxygen. Some of the hydrogens are attached to the carbon. How did I do that in the real world, in living biology? I cracked open a carbon dioxide molecule, and I cracked open water molecules, and I combined them. And so when you look at the chemistry of carbohydrates, what you see is that carbohydrates are composed of carbon and water molecules. Carbohydrates. There we go, finally. Carbohydrates have carbon, one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. That is basically a water stuck to a carbon. And the term carbohydrate tells you that. So a hydrate, anything with A-T-E on the end, sulfate, phosphate, hydrate, tells you it's combined with oxygen. So a hydrate is oxygen and hydrogen. Carbohydrate is carbon attached to a hydrate, which is hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, I think it helps to build these things first before we try to see what happens with them. <coughs> so we're going to start with what carbohydrates are important in 
uh, living systems, and then we'll start manipulating them a little bit more. So we have some simple carbohydrates. These are called the monosaccharides. What does the word root mono tell you? Mono is one. Saccharin, if something is saccharin, that means it's sweet. Monosaccharides have particular functional groups. We'll come back to these, carbonyl and hydroxyl. Not real worried about it at this point. And they're soluble in water. What does that mean? What does soluble mean? It means it dissolves or mixes well with water. Are these polar or nonpolar? Think back to what we did last week. What were the two kinds of polar bonds that we learned? Flip back through your notes if you need to. What are the two kinds of polar bonds that we have? What are they? The polar ones. What are they? OH and NH. And maybe C double bond over. We'll worry about that later. Do we have any OH bonds here? Look up here. Any OH bonds here? There's an oxygen and a hydrogen. OH, 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 OH. Five of them. On a molecule that's only six carbons long. Would you say there's a polar bond on just about every carbon? And this one, C double bond O, is slightly polar. Polar, 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 polar. Does so everybody see why it's soluble in water? So carbohydrates that are small enough, like our monosaccharides, are soluble in water. Okay, we can take these carbohydrates and we can build them into larger molecules. If I take two monosaccharides and put them together, what am I going to get? Two monos put together. Mono is one, what's the word for two? Di. So a disaccharide is two monosaccharides put together. Okay? And we'll talk about those. If it's a few, the word root for few is oligo. So an oligosaccharide has a few monosaccharides stuck together. I like to joke that biologists try not to count any more than we need to. So in general, we don't count past two. We might go up to three, that would be a trisaccharide. But in general, what we find is that things are either little or big. So we use the word root, word root oligo for things that are short chain, doesn't have any specific number. And we use the word root poly for things that are long. And polysaccharide has many of these uh, monosaccharides stuck together. Questions at this point between the word roots. So mono di. Oligo and poly. Got it? Okay, because we're going to use them again for some of our other organics. Now, there are some specific ones you need to know. And I'm going to give you a list of those so that you can write it down. So, for our monosaccharides, there are some that are five carbon that you need to know, and some that are six carbon that you need to know. Can you name a six carbon one? Glucose, okay. Anything with six carbons that's a sugar is called a hexose. What does hex mean? It means six, and O-S-E is our word root for sugar. So does anybody know what we would call a five carbon sugar? It's a pentose, it is. If I told you there are some trioses that are important, how many carbons are in a triose? That would be three. Okay, get the, get the naming protocol. Okay, so there are a couple of um, pentoses that you need to know. And then there are, let's see, for now, three hexoses that you need to know. These are all, uh, biologically important. I don't want you to think this is all of them. These are just all the ones we're starting with. So we have 
In the five carbon group, we have a sugar called ribose and a sugar called deoxyribose. I am never going to ask you to draw these. You just need to recognize them by name and know that they're five carbon for now. In our six carbon group, we have, of course, glucose. And I've already mentioned fructose, which is very often called fruit sugar. And then we have a sugar called galactose. Put that up there so y'all can see it. I think I did. Nope, did it backwards. Okay, so if I wanted to make a disaccharide, what am I going to do? Disaccharides? I have to take two monosaccharides and stick them together. We'll look at the chemistry of that before we're through today. Um, so if I took just two glucose molecules, one glucose plus another glucose, and I stick them together chemically, I'm going to get a disaccharide with a specific name that you need to know. It's called maltose. Maltose is malt sugar. Have you heard of malt sugar? Have you heard of malted milk? Or malt liquor? Or malt balls? Candy. Malt sugar has its own particular flavor on your tongue. It tastes a little bit different than table sugar. Table sugar is a glucose plus a fructose molecule. And when I take glucose plus fructose and put them together, I get the sugar we call sucrose. <clears throat> sucrose or table sugar is the most abundant plant sugar that's produced. So we get our granulated sugar that we put in our tea or wherever, we, we get that from plants. Does anybody know the two major sources for commercial sugar? What plants are we growing to, to get sugar from? Sugar cane, what's the other one? We use corn to get fructose actually, and that's through chemicals. So we use beets, sugar beets. Okay, I don't like beets, but I like sugar, so I can't complain too much. Okay, so sugar cane and sugar beets are the main two sources to get sucrose, but lots of plants produce sucrose. There is a third disaccharide that you need to know, and it's called milk sugar. And milk sugar is lactose. What does the word lact tell you? Lact is the word for milk, okay? So lactose is milk sugar. And it is made from one glucose plus one galactose. And galactose is just yet another isomer of glucose. They're, they have the same formula, C6H12O6. They have slightly different chemical bonds and in your body, they're recognized differently and they're treated differently. Okay, you have to have different enzymes, different uh, ways to pick up and absorb galactose compared to what you do with glucose. All right, does everybody have a list of three disaccharides? Questions about that? So for oligosaccharides, believe it or not, I don't have a specific example that I want to share with you, mostly because oligosaccharides are all kind of, um, at least for human biology, they're in the process of being digested. They're just fragments. Nobody cares what their names are. But for polysaccharides, I'm going to give you a list of four. So when I look at polysaccharides, what am I looking at? How many of my monosaccharides do I stick together? 
Is it a specific number for polysaccharides? What does it say on the screen? Hundreds or thousands, okay? And you get to a point where you can call it the same name even if it's not the exact same number. So there is no set number for these necessarily. Um, your book gives you three cellulose, starch, and glycogen. I'm going to give you a fourth one. Our fourth one is chitin. So what you need to know for these, a little bit of their chemistry and more about their uses, their biological importance. So if I ask you how you would classify cellulose, starch, glycogen, and chitin, what is your best answer? They're polysaccharides. If I ask you what major nutrient category they call them, what's the big category? Carbohydrates. This is not rocket science. This is just knowing what terms to associate. Okay, so they are in the category of carbohydrates called polysaccharides. Are you with me on that? All right, so um, does it matter how many glucoses we stick together? No, but it does matter that it is all glucose. So every one of these complex, the first three, cellulose, starch, and glycogen, are all made of glucose. Chitin is more complicated than that. Okay, so here you see cellulose, and cellulose is a structural carbohydrate found in plants. Cellulose is called that because it's the main component of the cell walls of plants. <coughs> Again, I'm not going to ask you to draw it. I may ask you to recognize a drawing of it when you see one, though. So what do you see in here in terms of what features would allow you to identify that this is a carbohydrate? How can you tell this is a carbohydrate? What do you see in it? Do you see the rings? They're color-coded for you. Do you see nothing but carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen? Do you see any carbon in there? You don't really see it, and that's because of the shorthand we use. And I kind of blitzed past that earlier. If it's a ring structure, every corner is a carbon, unless we label it. Okay? So on this one, you can see, oh, let's see right here. That little guy is an oxygen. Okay? Every other corner is unlabeled, so it's a carbon. Can you see that it's arranged in linear rows that are attached to each other? Okay, let's take a look at our next one. Here we have starch. What would you say about starch? <clears throat> Is it a polysaccharide? How do you know? It's really big. It's got a lot of repeating units of what are clearly monosaccharides. Now, the way they have this drawn, I think, is unfortunate because here they're just trying to show you, whoops, here they're trying to show you the structure of it, and that's fine. And here, over in this part, they're trying to show you the three-dimensional arrangement of it. This is like, it's kind of coiled up like a slinky, okay? So just because it's a long molecule, it tends to curl up like that. But it's not bonded in that way. It's just one long, continuous chain, okay? How is that different than cellulose? What did we see in cellulose? We have multiple straight chains all interconnected with each other, okay? So is it hard to tell cellulose from starch? Not once you know what to look at. Okay, here the next one is glycogen. What's the difference between starch and glycogen? <clears throat> Can everybody see here that we have branches? So glycogen has branching chains and cellulose is just long straight chains. So would you have trouble telling glycogen from starch once that's been pointed out to you? They're all three made out of glucose, nothing but glucose. 
okay? But the way that glucose is arranged in these three different polysaccharides is hugely important. Can you digest starch? Do you eat starch? Not in and of itself. It's not like you're going to eat powdered starch, but do some of the foods you eat have starch in them? Do you eat starchy foods? Can you name one? Potatoes, very starchy. So if you're eating white potatoes and you're skipping the skin, by the way, that's where all the nutrients are. So what is the, what is the, the delicious middle part of a white potato? What is that? It's almost completely starch. Okay? Um, other kinds of potatoes that have more pigment in them, like sweet potatoes, or some of the native potatoes are actually purple, or even a red potato, though, where's all the red color in a red potato? It's in the skin. How should be eating the skin? Clean it first. Scrub it. Cook it. Eat it. Okay? But the middle part of a white potato is really almost nothing but starch. Where else do you get starch in your diet? Breads and cereals, grains. Rice is a grain, wheat is a grain, corn is a grain. Those grains, when they are processed the way most Western diets process them, we're going to get rid of the, basically the skin on a potato. We're going to take that kernel on the inside. It's called the endosperm, and that's nothing but starch, or almost nothing but starch. So if you're eating white rice, that's like eating just the middle out of a potato. Okay? If you're eating brown rice, what are you eating? That's like eating the skin on your potato. Okay, that's where the nutrients are. All right, so far? All right, so the middle of that, the grain, the potato, that's all starch. So anything you make out of grain, rice cakes, bread, all of that stuff is a lot of starch. And that is starch in the true biological sense, which is, come on, this. Starch. Starch is made by plants. Do plants make starch so that you have something to eat? Is that why plants exist? Just making sure we have our biological biases under control here. Do plants exist so that humans have something to eat? Yeah, you think? I'm pretty sure not. I'm pretty sure if you could interview the plant, it would say, quit stealing my starch. Okay, so starch is to the plant its own stored energy. Okay, and we take that starch and we eat it. We're not, don't feel guilty about it. It's just part of the circle of life, but there you go. So um, plants also make cellulose. What do they make cellulose for? I've already mentioned this one. Cell wall structure. So cellulose is a structural component of plant cells. It reinforces that rigid cell wall that allows a plant to stand up against gravity. Okay, can humans digest cellulose? Can we digest it? Cellulose is in high concentration in foods like celery or leafy vegetables like salads. So generally, people in this area consume those when we're trying to, to satisfy our hunger without getting a lot of calories. Celery, cellulose, is not digested. Humans do not have the enzyme to digest cellulose, okay? In fact, there isn't an, a group that's taxonomy, taxonomically classified as animals that do. So think of animals that eat mostly plants, whether you're thinking of cows or rabbits or even termites, which eat wood. None of them produce the enzyme to digest cellulose. What they have in their gut is that they harbor microorganisms that can digest the cellulose for them, okay? So we don't have the enzyme to break down cellulose, but we do have the enzyme to break down starch, and it turns out the same enzyme that will digest starch will also digest glycogen. The chemical bonds in glycogen and starch are similar enough, even though glycogen branches and starch doesn't, they're similar enough that the same enzyme and break them down. Questions at this point? Okay, so a little bit about the naming rules that we've been talking about. We said that OSE indicates what? If you put OSE at the end of a word, what does that mean? Hexose, glucose, what does it mean? 
Sugar. O-S-E means sugar. A-S-E means enzyme, and so you got to learn to pay attention. So can you tell me what the difference between lactose and lactase is? Yeah, they look almost the same, right? One's a sugar, one's the enzyme that breaks down that sugar. So are they the same thing? Does it sound like a good idea to get them confused? That would be bad. Okay, so we have in human society, we have people who have a mutation that makes them lactase persistence. This, this is a mutation, lactase persistence. And that mutation is beneficial because most of us are lactose intolerant. Most humans are, well, not most humans, most original human groups are lactose intolerant. Do you know what that means? Have you heard of lactose intolerance before? So what does it mean to be lactose intolerant? Remember what lactose is, right? What is it? Milk, sugar. It's the, it's the sugar in milk. So if you like to drink milk or you like dairy products like, oh, I don't know, cottage cheese, ice cream, then you might be lactose intolerant if you start having digestive complaints after drinking milk or eating these dairy products. Common signs of lactose intolerance include bloating, that's gas accumulation that causes cramping, gas, which can be embarrassing. Diarrhea even can occur in lactose intolerance. So just as an example, my older daughter, when she was a year old, just a year old, had a viral infection. She got over it, but for about a week, she was sick with vomiting and diarrhea. Not much fun in a one-year-old. She was still in diapers. But still, not much fun. She got over it. Virus infections generally run their course within a week, and then your immune system kicks in and vanquishes it. But for about a year after that, I couldn't give her regular milk. She was lactose intolerant. And when I asked my pediatrician about it, he said, oh, yeah, she'll recover eventually. She'll recover the ability to digest milk. So she was lactose intolerant for about a year. Lo and behold, when I hit about 40, I became lactose intolerant. My parents, my dad was lactose intolerant. My daughter, that same daughter in her 30s, is now lactose intolerant. Her son, who's six, guess what? Lactose intolerant at the age of six. Okay, what does that mean? I'm telling you, that's the normal condition. It may not be fun, but it's normal. So if you compare that across the animal kingdom, in a natural setting, who gets the milk? Okay, let's back up a minute, and I want you to work in groups at your table. I want a one sheet of paper from each table, each table. So names on it, today's date, which is what? The sixth. First and last names, whoever has nice handwriting or relatively nice. And I have three basic questions I want you to answer first, just to make sure you're all with me here. Where does milk come from? And I mean that in a taxonomic sense. What animals, we know that plant milk is different. Soy milk, almond milk, we're not talking about that. We're talking about in the animal kingdom, what group of animals produces milk? There's only one answer to this. This is a right or wrong, put an answer. Don't leave it blank and fill it in later. I want to know right now whether you know the answer to that or not. And then the next part is within that animal group, what is the purpose of milk? That is, who does it, who does it nourish? Does everybody get to have milk? Because y'all grew up having milk at the grocery store, so you tend to have sort of an artificial view of milk.
All right, so what's the answer to the first question? Mammals. How many of you got that right? One person at each table, raise your hand if you got that right. Mammals, yes, no, maybe? Okay. All right, and then the second question, what's the answer? Offspring, that's probably not specific enough. You're on the right track, which is not a very accurate term. It's for nourishing offspring. Hey, I'm an offspring. Do I get milk? How about an eight-year-old <laughs> elephant that, whose mom is still there? Does an eight-year-old elephant who's the offspring of that mother elephant, does that offspring get milk? No. So be more specific. Offspring is right track, just not specific enough. So try again. Infants. Infants. Is that okay with everybody? And in fact, we tend to use the term infancy to refer to that period, not in humans so much, but in other animals. And what term do we use to apply to animals' offspring who no longer get milk, but the mama takes them off milk? What's the term for that? The term is weaning. We wean them, W-E-A-N. So a weaned offspring no longer gets to have mama's milk. Are you with me on all that? So outside of human culture, which is bizarrely artificial in a lot of ways, who's milk for? Milk is for infants, period. So is there any point in producing the enzyme lactase if you've been weaned? Is there any point to that? No. So the, the default setting for animals across the mammalian group the default setting is produce the enzyme lactase if you're an infant. And once you've been weaned, you're wasting time, energy, and nutrients producing an enzyme that no longer is used. Make sense to everybody? All right, so now can you tell me what lactase persistence is? Not that the enzyme keeps trying to break it down. So. You just keep producing the enzyme. So lactase persistence is the continued production of the enzyme lactase in non-infancy. That is, you've already been weaned, and here you are still drinking milk. Who does that? Well, it turns out it's not that common. So if we trace the mutation of lactase persistence we can trace it back to exactly three origins in three different parts of the world. This is a modern mutation. Well, to us it's not modern, but in geological terms it's extremely modern. So after modern humans arose, we can characterize people as either lactase persistent or lactose intolerant, and that's a life stage thing. So if you tested me at the age of 12, I was still lactase persistent, but now I'm lactose intolerant. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm two and a half year old and whenever she, um, when she was a baby and she's able to tolerate, you know, or actually an allergy. Well, she got diarrhea and everything, but then after, just after she turned two, I mean, it, it ended up, she was able to do yogurt and cheese, but it was the milk, and then she couldn't tolerate any dairy after that. But then after she turned two, she was able to start tolerating it. Okay, so that's a developmental stage. So very often when you introduce new foods to infants and toddlers, you introduce them one at a time until you figure out what it is. And for a while they can't, and then they develop the ability to. So that's, that has, that's not related to this, but it, is, it, it gets mixed up with this very often. So my daughter was the same thing. They break out in a rash. To me, that is an allergic reaction, even if it's temporary. Right. So she outgrew it. And that's not uncommon for allergies to be outgrown. Okay. All right. So back to this. Lactase persistence arose three different places in the world. One was in Africa. One was in North America. And one somewhere in Asia. Not, not, in, not in Far East Asia, but in the Middle East. And if you trace those mutations back to the original cultures associated with them, each and every one and nowhere else in the world, were dairy-raising cultures. So when you go to Africa, you find there are, there are groups whose culture is based around hunting, 
and you find groups whose culture is based around dairy herds. In which group do you think lactose persistence arose? Dairy, because if you were lactose intolerant, you wouldn't be drinking milk. It makes you sick. So once these mutations occurred and persisted, there was a lot of benefit to having milk available. But that's the origin of lactose, lactase persistence. Does everybody see that connection? Okay, so you've got these enzymes, and for each one of our disaccharides, you produce an enzyme to break them down, and the enzyme is named for the disaccharide. So our three disaccharides were maltase, excuse me, maltose, sucrose, and lactose. And our enzymes are named for them. So we have an enzyme called maltase, we have an enzyme called sucrase, and we have an enzyme called lactase. And so I've already given you what monosaccharides produce them, right? So in the case of maltose, it was two glucose molecules. You take a glucose, you stick it to another glucose, you get maltose. Sucrose from a glucose plus a fructose. Lactose from a glucose plus galactose. And these three enzymes are produced by your intestine and they break down the sugar in your diet, okay? So generally, by the time an animal is weaned, the gut just quits producing the lactase enzyme. And in just in some human groups, it persists for varying degrees of time. Um, you produce sucrase and maltase the rest of your life, but you don't eat a lot of malt sugar, do you? Most of us don't, but what we do eat is a lot of polysaccharides. So when I take my polysaccharides, what were those? Cellulose, starch, and glycogen. And we'll come back to chitin in a minute. We don't need a lot of chitin. There's an enzyme that breaks down cellulose. What do you want to call it? Cellulase. Do we produce it? No, we do not. Do termites produce it? No, they don't. Do cows produce it? No, they don't. Do rabbits produce it? No. Who produces cellulase? The microorganisms living in the guts of those animals that eat plant-heavy diets. Okay? Starch and glycogen are both broken down by the same enzyme, so I'm not going to name it for the specific thing it breaks down. Instead, I'm going to use the word root amyl, which means Basically, it means starch. So amylase is an enzyme that will break down either starch or glycogen. What does it break it down to? Can't break it down all the way to glucose, but what it can break it down to is maltose. And then I use the maltase to break down the maltose. Okay, our last polysaccharide, the one I added to our list, was chitin. Chitin is a polysaccharide found in um, insect exoskeletons and some other places. So when I mention it again, you'll go, oh yeah, that's just that weird polysaccharide. Do you eat a lot of insect exoskeletons? I think it's probably not, not on purpose anyway, right? Try not to think about what they might be in your peanut butter or wherever, but they're there, but you don't have an enzyme to break them down. Okay? So that's kind of the gist of, in, in terms of what I call descriptive chemistry, which is just naming and describing things. We have named and described some monosaccharides, some disaccharides, some polysaccharides. We mentioned oligosaccharides without mentioning any by name. You need to know the category. And you need to know this little bit about the enzymes and specifically which monosaccharides go together to make which disaccharides. Are you with me on all that?
Okay, so we're going to back up now to the chemistry of how do we do that. And to do that, we have to look at the chemistry of, in general, taking any two organic molecules and sticking them together, and then we'll figure out how to break them apart. Okay? So this term, condensation, what does condensation mean to you? Water condensing or coming out. So condensation is actually the old term. The new term is dehydration synthesis. I kind of liked condensation. First of all, it's shorter. Second of all, everybody knows what it means. You take water out, right? But what does it mean to dehydrate something? Take water out of it. And what does synthesis mean? Putting two things, two smaller things together into a bigger thing. So that was the preferred term. So in condensation or dehydration synthesis, what we're doing is we're taking two discrete monomers. Actually, we can take a, a polymer, doesn't matter, as long as you're working at the end of something. And you'll notice that marked here, I have two OH groups. Do you see them? Are those common on carbohydrates? Lots of them, right? So what I'm going to do is take those two uh, groups, I'm going to break the bonds, and then I'm going to reform those bonds. All right, so I'm going to show you up on our screen. Let's see, i got to remember which screen I'm going to use. That's sound. That's two. All right, so I'm not too worried at this point about whether I have my complete molecules or not. But here you can see I have two OH groups, right? Remember that every oxygen has to make two bonds? So if I break this bond and I break this bond, all I'm going to do is stick that oxygen with that carbon And then what else do I have? Water. That's all there is to it. Okay, so you start with two OHs. It doesn't even have to be two OHs. It has to be one OH with at least an H. But notice what I did here. Do you see that instead of a long chain of just carbons, I have an oxygen in the middle? Okay, so that's a sign to you that there was a bond made there. If you don't just have one long chain of carbons, that's a sign to you that there was a, a bond there. So what you see up on the other screen, you see the oxygen that's connecting our two ring structures together. Okay? All right, so when I um, want to do the opposite of that, I'm going to call it hydrolysis. What does hydro mean? Hydrogen is, hydro is water. Lysis, to lyse something. Is to break it. Break it, split it, burst it, something. Lyse is to break. So in hydrolysis, what am I doing? Look back over here. I'm going to split this, and I'm going to do it by adding water. So all I did was just the opposite. So hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis are just the opposite of each other. So everybody see how simple that is? Questions about that? All right, so is there any limit to how many of these I can do? I can string a bunch of glucose molecules together in one long starch or one long cellulose, and that's what we did before. So where we had our big long strings, what did I do to get each one of these attached to the next one? Do you see the oxygen in between? And everywhere you see an oxygen in between, what does that tell you? 
that was a dehydration synthesis reaction for each and every one to stick each one on. And even in the bonds in, well, these bonds in between are hydrogen bonds. How can I tell that? How do I know these are hydrogen bonds? It's hard to tell from looking at the screen, but those are little dotted lines. What do we know about dotted lines? Those are hydrogen bonds. They're bonds between the hydrogen of one molecule and the oxygen of another. Okay? So everybody have at least a vague understanding of how carbohydrates are formed, what they consist of, which examples you need to know. All right, what I want to do last is talk about these functional groups. There's a long list of them. And I'm going to test you on them. I am. It's just one of those things, okay? My advice to you on these is to make like flashcards or something for each one of them. I'm not going to test you on anything that's not on this list, but it's a long list. So how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Hey, that's not too bad, just eleven. All right? When I test you on them, it's not sufficient for you to recognize it in its form right there. So it won't look necessarily exactly like this. It may be as part of a molecule. So let's go back to our view of the carbohydrates and see where they are. And by the way, do you need to write that list down? Where can you find that list? It's in the notes online and where else? Hey, you got it in your textbook, okay? So let's look back at our structure of cellulose and see what we find. Okay, does everybody see that there's an OH group right here? Did you see the OH? Got it? So when you see that on a test, then you need to be able to say, aha, uh -huh, I see that OH group. And now I'm gonna look it up on the list. There it is. Okay, so what I want you to do for practice is take a look at this list in your book, look through all of the larger molecules in your book, and see if you can practice identifying them. Okay, you need to know them by name and by structural formula. So if you see something that is like this or like that, then you name that group. Okay, that's a methyl group. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this? Does everyone have their name on a sheet of paper today? If you came in late, I have some papers to return to you perhaps, so if you would just check with me briefly. I'm gonna post this lecture and I'll put the link up sometime in the next hour, so if you wanna review this lecture, you can.